Thank you, everyone, for coming to my talk. The attacker has expensive radio equipment, but your Android phone is resilient. My name is Yamna. I'm from the Android connectivity security team at Google. Um, so who am I? Uh, previously, I worked at EFF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, on CertBot and Let's Encrypt, and also doing cellular security research there. I've been a speaker at BangBangCon, Real World Cryptography, and more. And my first strange loop was in 2015. So here's an overview of what I'll be covering today. Um, sorry, problem with the slides. OK. First is, what is actually happening at a protocol level when your phone connects to a cellular network? And what does it even mean to be connected to a cell network? Second, we'll be covering the long history of attackers taking advantage of cellular protocol flaws to do mass surveillance and harm people. And I just want to add here that this talk does come with a content warning. There will be multiple mentions of war and conflict. And finally, we'll take a look at what it's like to implement radio security improvements in Android. And I mean Android, the operating system. This talk does not have anything to do with like, making Android apps. And I just want to talk a bit about my personal motivations for why I'm giving this talk. I think phone radios and phone networks are way more mysterious than they should be. There's actually a lot of cool stuff I don't see talked about in the usual software engineering spaces related to phone networks. So hopefully, I can get some of you all interested in this. Uh, also, just tra providing transparency about what we've been doing and how we've been doing it at Android is important. So let's go over some terminology first. Uh, so first, we have cell towers. Uh, and these are like the connections of antennas and computers that your phone talks to to help you get connected to the network. People who work on mobile network stuff uh, usually just call them cells or base stations, so or BTS for short, and which is one of the ways I'll be referring to them throughout this talk. They're also often called cell sites or, weirdly, e-node Bs in the standards, but I won't use that. Also, even though they have the word tower in them, they're often not actually towers anymore, but usually just rectangular antennas mounted on buildings, like you see in this photo. So next up, there are network generations, such as 2G, 3G, et cetera. The G refers to the generation of the protocol. For example, the most popular 2G protocol is called GSM. GSM was standardized in the 1980s and began to be deployed in the late 80s, early 90s, which was almost like 30 to 40 years ago. Um, and even though there are many protocols beyond 2G, sorry, beyond 2G protocols beyond GSM, I'll be using 2G and GSM interchangeably, and GSM is the focus of this talk. Also, please appreciate how cool and retro the GSM logo is. Um, <laughs> So also I'm going to skip over 3G because it's not widely used anymore or widely studied. And then after that, there is the most widely used protocol in the world today, which is the 4G LTE one. With LTE came many security and performance improvements. And that's why we still use it today uh, for basically everything. And of course, then there's 5G, which is still pretty new. It's supposed to offer like, significantly faster connection speeds and stuff. And finally, what exactly is Android? Well, it's an open source operating system meant not to run not just on phones, but many other types of devices, but primarily phones. And the open source release is referred to as AOSP, which is short for the Android Open Source Project. So all the code I'm covering today, links will be provided to where you can view the original source. Um, and Android is the most widely used mobile operating system in the world, with about 70% of mobile phones using it. Um, and many organizations take Android, and they customize it, and they modify it, and they put it on hardware that they manufacture themselves, and they sell. And we refer, we refer to organizations who do this as OEMs, or Original Equipment Manufacturers. So <laughs> usually in these types of talks, there is a diagram of a phone connecting to a cell tower. But to be a bit more accurate, the physical chip in your phone which handles connecting to the cell towers is called a modem, also known as the radio or the baseband. All these terms are interchangeable, and I will be using them interchangeably throughout this talk. So modems are produced by OEMs, such as Qualcomm, MediaTek, Samsung, etc. Android is separate from the modem. The modem has its own operating system. And Android and the modem have to communicate with each other across a hardware boundary. So let's say you turn your phone on, and it needs to connect to the network. The first thing it's going to do is initiate a process called cell search to find an appropriate cell tower to use. At a high level, 
it's going to look for an authoritative cell tower to tell it about all the local cell towers it can actually use. So let's go through what this looks like step by step, step in GSM, the 2G protocol from the 90s. And please note this is a heavily simplified version of what's actually happening in practice. So first, the modem will scan for any signal on some pre-programmed bands. So bands are ranges of frequencies that are stored on the SIM card. And why are they stored on the SIM card? Because they correspond to your carrier, carrier who you got your SIM card from, and the carrier is allotted by the government frequencies they're allowed to use in certain areas. Also, why are they pre-programmed? Well, to save time and help the user get online faster. If for some reason the list is missing or like corrupted, then the modem knows to scan all possible GSM bands looking for something to connect to, but that's a lot slower. So for every frequency it scans, it records the signal strength in a table that's sorted from st strongest to weakest. Then, starting from the top, it goes through the list one by one, and for each entry, needs to determine if the signal it detected actually corresponds to a real broadcast from a cell tower and isn't just like some random noise it picked up. So to know if it's usable, it's looking for a fixed tone that's being broadcast that it already knows how to decode. When it decodes it, it should be a bunch of zeros followed by a message declaring this channel is what's called a broadcast control channel. And this is what indicates you found an authoritative source of what cell towers nearby you can use. And it'll tell you all the relevant parameters you need to find them and complete connecting to them. And most importantly, any info you need about decoding signals from these other cell towers. Just like in programming, if you have a bunch of garbled text you need to decode and you don't know how it was encoded, then you're going to be stuck. And yeah, as part of decoding the message, you do get the literal list of nearby towers you can use. And this is called the BCCH allocation list. And BCCH is broadcast control channel. So at this step, you just pick any one from that list and you move on. And cell search is complete. And it's time to connect. So now begins the process of negotiating with the cell tower you previously found. We call the first time you attach to a new tower without having immediately been connected to another one right before the initial attach. So for example, if you're on a train, the train's moving really fast and you're hopping between cell towers, um, then that would be a handover between the cell towers. It's not the initial attach. So the first thing that happens is the phone modem sends over this type of message called a location update request, declaring to the network, I'm here. Here's my identification number, and here's the last cell tower I was connected to. Um, also, going back to this, so the identification number it sends over is called the MC IMSI, and let's talk about this. So, it's your unique identifier. It's short for International Mobile Subscriber Identity. Uh, it's used to identify you to the network. It's stored on your SIM card. It's assigned by your carrier, and it's a sensitive value that needs to be kept private. And it needs to be kept private because we don't want radio traffic to easily be associatable with, with like, who it originated from or who it belongs to, or um, be used to indicate that a certain user is in an area or they're not in an area. So um, the next thing the network does is it responds with an authentication request. And it's like, can you prove you are who you say you are? And then the phone does some cryptography calculations and sends over an authentication response. And the network is like, cool, you're authenticated. Going to send over information about the cryptography algorithm we'll be using for encrypting, sorry, encrypting communications between us. And the phone is like, OK, got it. I will use the cryptography you tell me to. Uh, and then the network is like, OK, everything's great. Now that we've done all that, I've accepted your initial location update request message. And here's your temporary identifier, the Timsey TMSI so that when you contact me in the future, you don't always have to use your private sensitive identifier, which is the MC that we discussed before. And then the phone is like, cool, I acknowledge receipt of my temporary identifier. So just as an aside, uh, something to keep in mind is that phones aren't actually continuously connected to cell networks. They're usually in what's called idle mode, and they don't reconnect unless the user does something to trigger needing to reconnect. For example, you're placing a call, 
Otherwise, they're listening to a frequency called a paging channel that tells them to, when to revive the full connection so they can receive content, like a call, SMS, or data if you're waiting on something web-based. And there's different ways to reattach back to the network to optimize for whatever the user is doing. So just keep in mind, it might not always be the same as the example we just went through. So even though you may pick up your phone at any given time and look and see it has full bars, it's likely the phone radio is just asleep, actually, like mostly asleep and not doing anything other than listening for paging messages. And this is important because the phone radio uses a lot of battery when active, so their activity needs to be minimized as much as possible, and the design of cellular protocols reflects that. So unfortunately, 2G has some major security issues, and all of them appear in that small connection example we just went through. The first is that the sensitive identifier, the MC, is just sent over to anything that looks like a cell tower. And that means like anything that's broadcasting on the right frequency. Um, and these are frequencies that anyone can look up, by the way. And there's also very cheap off-the-shelf hardware to put up hobbyist cell towers and open source projects you can use to do this. Then immediately after this, while there is an authentication request, it's only the network trying to authenticate the phone. When they were designing GSM in the 80s, they never thought that phones would need to authenticate the network and that people might go on to like put up cell, fake cell towers to try and track users and intercept their communications. But as you'll soon see, this is in fact a major problem. And then it's cool that they try to use encryption on the connection, but unfortunately, <laughs> <laughs> Every GSM cipher is either completely broken, like it's trivial to break over the air, or it's very easy to break. And a lot of carriers just don't even use encryption, as we've recently found out. They send over what's called a null cipher, so all the content is just XORed with a string of zeros as the encryption step. And to take things further, there's no integrity protection in GSM, meaning intercepted communications can easily be modified. And finally, this is less of a protocol flaw, but more of an implementation flaw that we see in practice. So the temporary identifier will often just be the MZ that they send over. <laughs> <laughs> or it won't be rotated as often as it's supposed to be, and it's trivial to figure out which MC corresponds to which TIMZ from later connection attempts. There's even more problems, but that's all that's in scope for this talk. So anyone can put up something that looks like a fake cell tower, or sorry, looks like a real cell tower, and Phones will attempt to connect to it over GSM and disclose sensitive identifiers. And then the users are vulnerable to having their data intercepted and even modified. And you may ask, are people really doing this? Is it that much of a problem? And not only do people do this extensively, they've been doing it since the 90s, and it's happening all over the world. So there's many names for these fake cell towers, such as uh, fake base stations, short for, shortened to FBS, Cell Site Simulator, MC Catcher, Stingray, which is a very popular brand name, Rogue Cell Towers, Rogue Base Stations, and so many more. And it's not hard to make one of these at home. There's a lot of open source projects around doing it that I mentioned, and the radio equipment is very cheap, like $15 if you want a low quality GSM one. Or for example, this picture on the right, this is a picture of one of my students' home setups, though this is like a professional setup that costs closer to 15K. So there have been many high-profile cases regarding the use of MC catchers in the last few years. So recently, news broke that there were MC catchers all over DC being used to spy on politicians and lawmakers, but that the government didn't have the resources to figure out where they were or how to find them at the time. Then, 1.5 years later, officials from DHS claimed they were placed there by Israeli spies to gather information about the president's correspondence, but no other details were revealed at the time. And like most surveillance technology in the United States, it's used disproportionately to target minorities when used against the general public. The byline of this article is, cops are using secret cell phone trackers nationwide to collect cell phone data, especially in poor black neighborhoods. And just as an aside, if you're interested in knowing more about surveillance technology that's being used 
near to where you are or in, anywhere in the United States, there's this awesome website called the atlasofsurveillance.org. So here's a screenshot. I was using it just before this talk and looking up like what is there around like in Missouri. And if you look at the bottom one, the third one, it says St. Louis Police Department acquired a cell site simulator, specifically the Stingray model in 2011. And I didn't actually scroll lower than this. There could be more. Like they might have newer ones. I don't know. It's also hypothesized that one of the delivery mechanisms of the Pegasus malware by cyber mercenary group NSO that's being used to monitor journalists and activists and other high profile individuals is being transmitted via fake base stations. And while the details of how loading malware onto a phone via a radio is out of scope of this talk, it's not out of scope of this other talk by my teammates where we developed an, just this, an exploit targeting a modem, and we loaded it onto a phone via a fake base station that we had set up in the lab. So if, go watch that if you want a much more in-depth explanation of how to do something like that. So right now, the war in Ukraine, it's been revealed recently that Russia is using these car drone hybrid based systems to monitor cellular and data transmissions, suppress wireless communications, locate in real time where certain phones are, or if there are any phones in a particular area. And this is again, based on those MC disclosures I mentioned earlier, and even send fake text messages to Ukrainian soldiers. So here are some examples of those fake text messages that are attempts at psychological warfare um, against the Ukrainian soldiers, and they're enabled by these drone-mounted MC catchers. So on the left, this screenshot of a tweet from 2017, the soldier received a text saying, you are a corpse, leave and you'll live. And Ukraine is a particularly interesting case because it's one of the places in the world where we have the most evidence of cellular surveillance going back more than a decade. Um, so before, even before, the war, Ukraine had major, major national protests and a change in power between like 2012 to 2014. And in one of those protests, fake cell towers were set up and it was broadcasted to all the protesters. You are registered as a participant in a riot in an attempt to disrupt the protests. This, and again, this particular case, what happened in the 2012-2014 period. So in both these examples, like these are attempts at mimicking targeted surveillance, but really, like these texts are just being sent to everyone uh, within range of the attacker's radios. In China, there was a series of like, malware phishing campaigns advertising spam that were spread via fake base stations that were placed in people's cars. So the reach was wider because the people with the radios in their car, they're like driving around everywhere. And it's also harder to catch the spammers because they're moving. So it's harder to pinpoint where the signal is coming from. Eventually they did arrest the creator of the malware and apparently like hundreds of drivers, but it still kept spreading around afterwards because they weren't able to catch everyone. Also this one they called swearing Trojan because when they eventually reversed some of the malicious app code, uh, the people reversing it said there was an unusually high amount of swearing in the comments. <laughs> And the same thing is also happening in Thailand. A group of people were arrested driving around with fake base stations, sending phishing links to steal information from people. And just this group in particular in Thailand made tens of millions of dollars from the scam. So also from earlier this year, this is my favorite example, French police pulled over a driver for being intoxicated and in searching the car, they found all this radio equipment in the back. So. They decided it had to be a bomb, so they detonated it, only later to discover it's a fake base station used for proliferating sensitive healthcare phishing scam SMS messages. And like this was going on when you were buying your tickets to this conference. So yes, this is a very real problem. And last year, there was an attempt to disrupt the federal elections in the Philippines People at polling stations received emergency alerts on their phone endorsing a candidate, the same candidate who went on to win the elections, but all local carriers denied this emergency alert having gone through their network. And it turns out fake base stations were being sold on Facebook Marketplace, and someone bought one and did this. The federal government 
later banned the, the sale of this type of equipment on Facebook Marketplace in response. So this one is the only example I've included of an attack that, while it requires a fake base station, is not 2G specific. In fact, this emergency alert spoofing attack doesn't even work on 2G because 2G doesn't support uh, the emergency alerts. So this is just like 4G and newer. Uh, I included it anyway because it's in interesting that all these critical wireless emergency alerts aren't authenticated at all, and anyone can broadcast them nearby. Broadcast them, and nearby phones will go off. So something I hear very often is people saying, 2G security problems don't matter because there's so few places left with 2G coverage, and carriers are sunsetting 2G networks. But that doesn't matter. What matters is your phone is still willing to accept random 2G connections from anything that calls itself a cell tower and broadcasts at high enough power. So, and from all those examples of the attacks I shared, with the exception of the last one, the one thing they all have in common is they rely on the phone to accept a 2G connection when convenient. So beginning in Android 12, which was released in 2021, we introduced the ability to disable 2G at the radio hardware level, so the phone will not use 2G at all unless the user initiates an emergency call and the phone otherwise doesn't have any reception and so it has to expand the frequencies it's searching on for a connection to try the 2G ones. Also, for a phone to see this change, it needs to have the radio hardware new enough to have had the relevant changes implemented modem side, um, aka higher, like an API level higher than 1.6 for the radio hardware, but I will talk about that more in a bit and what that means. So that's why if you're pulling out your phone to look for the setting, as I see some of you doing, um, <laughs> you <laughs> might not see it because your radio hardware might not be up to date. So let's talk about implementation details. So the most imp interesting part of implementing this is how does the Android operating system communicate to the hardware that 2G isn't allowed anymore? And what does that interface look like and where does it live? So this is a high level diagram of how Android operating system is structured. At the top is the user facing stuff and closer to the bottom, it's where the low, lower level hardware facing code lives. So it's at the hall or hardware abstraction layer where we specify the APIs between what Android can communicate to the modem and vice versa are. In particular in Android, we call this particular hall iRadio, which is short for radio interface. So when we have an idea for a feature that should exist in Android that needs to talk to the modem, we come up with the appropriate APIs um, at, that need to live at the OS radio boundary. And then before implementing them, we share them with all the hardware vendors we work with to get feedback from them, being like, can you actually implement this? Like, is this realistic? And then there are many different hardware vendors we work with, and we have to get input and consensus among all of them before we do anything. It's a very long, involved process. So we designed an API that allows us to enable and disable any, roto, any combination of radio protocols that Android supports. So it's not just 2G focused, so it's more flexible. And this one was called Set Allowed Network Types Bitmap. The comment above the API is where the implementation details are specified. Um, on the top line, you can see it lays out the restrictions for searching and regis registering. So even if, if you've disabled 2G, the modem is not even supposed to scan on the 2G bands, like it is forbidden. And it's worth noting that pre-Android 12, there was an older API with a similar name, set preferred network types bitmap, but that API was only for setting a preference, and this one was for completely disabling certain network types. And I included that because I mean, it's in the comment documentation, but people often ask me about it. Uh, and you can see the parameters are the, like a serial number to keep track of the request from the OS to the hardware, which is useful for when you see the callback API later, and also a bitmap that represents which network types are allowed. So here's the API for when the radio responds. It's in this other file called iradioresponse.hal where all the response APIs are, respond, are, are defined. And you don't see the serial parameter here because it's wrapped up in this other parameter called radio response info. Um, but yeah, this is not too interesting on its own. Um, and in addition to setting the allowed network types, we can also query them, which is what this is for. Um, 
Anyway, I would encourage you to look through this directory in AOSP, the Hardware Interfaces Radio 1.6. Uh, I think it's really interesting to see all the APIs for controlling the phone radio, um, especially since the comments are written in a pretty readable way. Um, and one consequence of this feature requiring a hardware level change is it now means that only phones with newer hardware can have this feature. So modems rarely get major software version bumps after they leave the factory for many reasons, mostly due to certification requirements, but that's a topic for another day. So I think that normally when people give these types of talks, they go through the whole implementation step by step, but there isn't time for me to do that because it's really big. Um, so I'm just gonna focus on the parts that I think are cool and sort of jump around and tell you about interesting parts of the Android telephony stack um, so you can just like take pictures and investigate it later on your own. So in case you want to look up where and how messages to and from the modem are handled in the main phone radio process, it's basically just a giant loop with case statements that cover every possible event to and from the modem. And this happens in this file called phone interface manager. So for example, here's the part for the case statement that covers handling Android sending down the request to the modem to update what network types are allowed. So jumping to another part, uh, this is totally different. Say you'd previously called the, called the hardware API and disabled 2G, then you go and restart your phone. Upon rebooting, how does Android know the value of what network types were allowed and which weren't? Unfortunately, you can't rely on the modem to have remembered and to persist the setting at the hardware level and not, like, not all chipsets will do that for you, although some will. The way it actually works is Android has a special database called the SIM database that remembers values relevant to your SIM card. So this is just a screenshot of some columns from that database. So now looking at the main controller for the toggle, it's just Java and some XML. And I decided to show this because I think it's interesting to see what actually counts as 2G beyond just GSM. So if you look at line 55 and below, the 2G bit mask also includes GPRS, Edge, CDMA, and a really ancient protocol called 1XRTT. I was really surprised when I looked up and saw 1XRTT was 2G and not 1G. Um, yes, yeah, so these are all older 2G protocols and they all have security problems. Anyway, so we released this in 2021 and iOS announced a few months ago that they are including the ability to disable 2G in their new iOS 17 release. So EFF, a digital privacy nonprofit, had a campaign asking them to include the ability to disable 2G in iOS, and they did it, so that's really awesome. And based on this news article, I think they don't let you use it on its own, though. You have to use it as part of lockdown mode, but I don't really know. So if you're interested in this topic generally and want to learn more, there's another similar feature that is being released in the upcoming Android 14 release. It's the ability to reject all cellular connections that don't use proper encryption and integrity protection. Um, so like I said before, when they send over the null cipher and the, the encryption algorithm is just XORing with a string of zeros. Um, so yeah, if you use this, it will configure your phone such that it only connects to cell towers that use good cryptography. And a helpful analogy for this is it's like going from HTTP to HTTPS for the cell connection. So there's a talk, we have a talk about this at, from Real World Cryptography earlier this year about what implementing this was like, which is very similar to what I covered today. Um, but it focuses more on the cryptography part and issues with it and also covers a bit about what it's like to work directly with cellul cellular standards organizations. Um, anyway, the talk link is there if you're interested. So I was talking to a friend about how in working on this project, we had to do everything from hands-on radio engineering in the lab, negotiating with hardware vendors, implementing everything in Android, including implementing the UI, and they were like, nice, full stack engineering. Um, <laughs> yeah, and thank you for coming to my talk, and that's all. <laughs>